All right, boys and girls, we are back with another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. I'm your host, Ben Dominich. You can email us, as always, at radio at thefederalist.com. Follow us on Twitter at FDRLST. I'm happy to be joined today by the Secretary of the Department of the Interior, David Bernhardt. You can follow him on Twitter at Sec Bernhardt. Thanks so much for taking the time to join us today, sir. Well, it's great to have a chance to visit with you, man. I wanted to talk to you about a number of different things, uh, but first off, let's start with this. Uh, I know the president is headed to Mount Rushmore this week for the first uh, fireworks that have gone off there in quite some time, thanks to uh, a number of different issues. Can you tell us a little bit about what's going to happen out there and, and what's been going on in terms of the fireworks at Mount Rushmore? Well, um, as you may or may not know, um, the president of the United States, just like some of our founding fathers, um, has a great love of um, our nation's Independence Day and believes that it should be celebrated with um, a great deal of fanfare. Um, John Adams perhaps gave the most um, uh, resonating point of what, um, what um, should be celebrated across the coast to coast, across the continent. Um, and the president uh, visited with the governor of North Dakota, um, I think maybe a couple of years ago now. And she uh, inquired uh, of him about the possibility of uh, having the fireworks celebration at Mount Rushmore. And um, he asked us to look into it. We went through a process of evaluating um, the environmental um, uh, requirements that we would need to comply with, and then working with Governor Nome of South Dakota to uh, put a program together. And I think it will be spectacular, quite honestly. Um, it should be a wonderful uh, celebration. Good for South Dakota, uh, great for um, the Department of the Interior, and great for America. And then the president will also, on the 4th of July, um, have a salute to America, a small salute to America, um, at the uh, White House. Um, and then, of course, the Department of the Interior will be uh, conducting a uh, fireworks display. And there will also be an incredible uh, air show put on by the Department of Defense. Um, so I think you'll see a very large air show and a very large fireworks on the 4th of July um, if you're in this area. There's a uh, poll, a survey that was conducted by a Canadian academic, Eric Kaufman. Uh, he's the author of the book White Shift. He's a respected uh, uh, social scientist and, um, and, analysis, and does all sorts of analysis of various factions within uh, American political life. And he did a survey that he released last uh, week on Quillette, uh, where he was looking at the positions of American liberals when it came to a host of different matters, mostly having to do with the law and the Constitution uh, and the like, uh, museums and, and statues. But one of his questions that stuck out to me was about Mount Rushmore. He asked whether people supported the elimination or the destruction of Mount Rushmore, uh, just given the problematic nature of uh, the people it depicts. He found that 44% of self-identified liberals and 58% of self-identified very liberals supported eliminating Mount Rushmore. Now, I'm not saying that that's something that's realistic or going to happen, but when it comes to something like that, something that's under the purview of the Department of Interior, what is your attitude when you hear those types of numbers? Well, first, that number is uh, stunning to me. I mean, when you look um, who are depicted, uh, Marsh, Mount Rushmore, um, our founding uh, father, uh, George Washington, um, the man who brought us together as a country and kept us together, Abraham Lincoln, uh, Teddy Roosevelt, our great, uh, uh, great conservationist, and Thomas Jefferson. Um, I find that number surprising, but it's, it's certainly fine for people to have views. And my view is that, you know, at the Department of the Interior, we have a very simple job, and that job is what Congress lays out for us in the law. And um, that law says that we are to um, preserve um, uh, these uh, works for future generations. And that's our current duty. If Congress um, decides that they want to change the law and um, the president signs a law and that law becomes effective, then my job is to carry out that law. And so there's a process that's lawful for people who would like to see um, a monument modified or 
a new monument created or even a current monument taken down. But I believe, I believe the vast majority of Americans love uh, these uh, monuments and memorials. And it's my view that most of them have gone through a very careful analysis, and then they were delicately and deliberately placed where they were, often with great fanfare. Um, you know, presidents show up, um, members of Congress endorsed um, legislation to create these monuments. These were done with deliberation and care, and they speak um, to what um, should bind us together. And so I personally believe that far more people um, gather inspiration from these monuments and memorials than those who um, are, see them as a distraction or distortion. But Congress has the ability to do what they want to do. And, and my job is to carry out the law faithfully, whether uh, it's one I would write or not. I've had a number of questions thrown my way uh, by both readers and by some of our contributors in the past couple of weeks about the nature of these statues and who actually owns them, uh, owns the property, and is is uh, responsible for protecting and maintaining them. And I know that that might be different in terms of you know statue to statue, but I'm curious about that. And I'm also curious about the possibility in some instances where statues that might uh, fall under government purview now could be purchased in ways by, by private entities or private individuals, institutions that might want to protect or maintain them, even if uh, the locality or the state that they are in, the city that they're in, uh, sees fit to do away with them. Well, you're absolutely right that it does vary greatly. Um, it depends on the property. Um, that these uh, monuments, memorials, or statues are located on. Um, you know, at the Department of the Interior, we are primarily focused on those um, uh, items that are within our jurisdiction and control. Um, sometimes that's quite complicated, in all honesty. And in um, Washington, D.C., the Department of the Interior manages about one-fifth of the land. Um, and something that might look like it's um, uh, under the jurisdiction of the Park Service, maybe under the jurisdiction of the Metro PD, and vice versa. But, um, but the reality is that localities, in many instances, have decided, states have decided um, to place these uh, memorials on, on, on their property or a local park or state land. And in those cases, they, they are the holder and our owner and guardian of those properties. Um, if it's on federal land, um, it may be the Department of the Interior, it may be the General Services Administration, it can vary. Uh, but ultimately, um, for many of the items that are on uh, federal land, um, the Department of the Interior is the uh, um, carer of that, uh, caretaker of that facility. Yeah. Now, what does that require of you in terms of this current type of event in the sense that the Department of Interior, I'm sure, does not necessarily have the law enforcement resources to face down a riotous or potentially violent mob, you know, seeking to topple uh, a major historical statue. I think everyone was probably pretty shocked to see how far along uh, those rioters outside of the White House got in, uh, in Lafayette Square, where they were you know, really, you know, throwing a lot of, of uh, uh, bands and ropes and, and chains around uh, what is uh, an incredibly valuable historical bronze equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson uh, that is very prominent uh, and is actually the first equestrian statue in the history of the United States. Um, the, to me, you know, I think that people were looking at that and basically feeling, you know, if this had gone on for another 10 or 15 minutes, then they might have been seen that statue destroyed or, or toppled to the ground. Um, the, the DC Metro PD and other entities, uh, you know, rolled in and prevented that from happening. Uh, what can the Department of the Interior do in, uh, in your capacity to protect these statues or to prevent those kinds of, of uh, you know, flash mob violent events from deciding for us as opposed to having decisions made in a, 
in a practical, political, you know, democratic and representative manner? Well, um, first off, I really appreciate your summary there uh, because the reality is um, um, last Monday night when that occurred, um, the actual operation on the ground was an operation um, uh, by these folks that if you were to watch it, you'd see that it was a highly coordinated event. They went in um, and um, looked visually like a very peaceful um, protest. I mean, if you watch it, they, they emerged, they, they moved up to the uh, front of the barricades right in front of the White House. And then they sprung into action, moved the fence, encircled it with their arms, and the people leapt up. And uh, what, what subsequently happened is um, uh, the uh, U.S. Park Police and uh, uniform units of the U.S. Secret Service uh, went in um, and uh, uh, outside beyond the park, um, uh, U.S., uh, sorry, uh, D.C. Metropolitan Police uh, were in action too. So it really was, uh, and if you watch it, it was, um, it took a while uh, as these people sprung into action. Uh, but once the police went in, they dealt with it quite quickly in all honesty. But in during that time, they didn't only damage the statue, they completely destroyed um, um, cannons um, that were very significant. This is a wonderful work of art. You know, what you said about um, it's, it's kind of the first of its kind um, as a monument, 20,000 people showed up for its commemoration. Uh, the president of the United States uh, was there in its unveiling. Um, and these are very significant things. And my, my own view is um, that area, Lafayette Park, is the quintessential uh, public square. I would do anything I could to ensure that somebody can come there and state their piece, whatever it is. Uh, that's that's completely, completely appropriate. And it's quintessentially um, the, the place that we would want to protect that activity. But when you come there and you have one intent, which is to destroy uh, this incredible work of art, um, it's, it's unconscionable. And, um, and what these folks are going to find out is the consequences of doing that are quite severe. There are both uh, criminal penalties for the willful destruction of government property and their civil penalty, civil uh, recourse that we have for uh, the recruitment of costs. And um, what's happened there is our investigators have been working with the Department of Justice. We've invested, we've um, already identified and um, arrested uh, an individual and charged others. And they're gonna see that continue. This is not, um, this is not the way to go about changing the contents of the public square. There are ways, and they're enshrined in the exact same constitution that enshrines your ability to speak in the public square. Anyone has the right to petition their government. Anyone has a right to call their congressman and say, hey, um, I really dislike this. I think it should be moved or changed or, or, or modified or replaced. And that is a great thing for Congress to consider and make a decision. Maybe this particular statute does or does not reflect our values. But you can't exercise self-help and just decide what the heck we're gonna do it. These things were um, placed here for a reason and, and there's a process to go through to deal with it if you don't like it. But if you try self-help, we are gonna come down in a way that's very severe for you. It's not jaywalking. Ben, you're muted. Yeah. I, I think uh, I think one of the aspects of this that uh, we failed to appreciate is that these are, in many instances, priceless works of art, in addition to being symbols of what we value, which means that when you tear one of these things down, you can't necessarily just put it back together again. Um, the uh, There was this uh, really, uh, I mean, it's it's humorous in a darkly comedic way, but there was this quote from a, a protester a rioter in uh, uh, in uh, Minneapolis where they tore down the statue of uh, a Union soldier and abolitionist uh, and uh, they uh, 
decapitated the statue and they threw it into the lake. Uh, and they had a quote that was in the local indie magazine uh, who quoted one of the protesters as saying, after they had pulled it down, looking at the inscription on the base of the statue, who even is this guy? <laughs> and I feel like that is uh, a- It's outrageous. I think that that's just the way that is uh, that these folks are approaching this right now there is no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, I knew that things had gotten uh, a, a very silly when I saw that a statue of, uh, of the, uh, <laughs> a, 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 that, well, a number of different statues obviously in California went down, including you know, Ulysses S. Grant and, uh, and, uh, and others who uh, were defaced. But the one that seemed to me the most ridiculous was the, that of uh, Miguel Cervantes, <laughs> who uh, was, uh, you know, obviously the author of Don Quixote, and uh, maybe they thought he was a conquistador. You know, who knows what they what they thought he was in terms of uh, the statue. But uh, it's one of these instances where it doesn't really matter who you are. It's no longer a debate about, you know, where do we put Confederate statues? Do we put them in the in the square? Do we put them in a museum? Uh, what's kept and what isn't? It's moved far beyond that. Why haven't we heard more statements? from not just Capitol Hill, but from leaders across the country. Many well, of you know, have, have, have historically wrapped themselves in the flag on these points, standing up for uh, these statues, not just as, as history, but as emblematic of, of the story that we uh, have learned about America and ourselves. Well, I think uh, the president is standing very strong on this issue. Um, his, his act Friday was, um, I think very clear in saying to both the entire federal government and to the radical criminals who want to do these type of disruptive events, look, we're going to bring the resources of the federal government to bear on investigating these crimes. We're going to uh, bring the federal government's resources to bear to protect these national uh, uh, monuments and works of art. Um, we're going to prosecute people to the full extent of the law. And um, we're going to investigate with, with great diligence. Um, so there are severe consequences to doing this. And I think he did that Friday, and that was very significant. The other thing he did that I think is very significant is he basically said to local and state leaders in this executive order, um, don't count on the free lunch. Don't count on the fact that if you're just letting this happen, if you're just letting these things be destroyed, don't count on us not looking at our own authorities and saying where we can, um, we're gonna take that into account as we look at funding for you. And um, I think that's significant. Um, so he has stepped up and um, you know, I believe that the vast majority of America draws solace, uh, draws um, inspiration and draws rejuvenation from these great works of art. I mean, if you have ever been to the Jefferson Memorial or the Lincoln Memorial, and um, you, you had, when you walk in uh, to these um, facilities, there is no way to leave without thinking um, what incredible individuals and equally what incredible um, leaders we've had throughout our nation's history. I mean, when I walk in uh, to the Lincoln, and you know, as you walk up the stairs, on the left um, is the Gettysburg Address, on the right is uh, the second uh, inaugural. I mean, those, those are incredible um, things to uh, review. And the reality is each of these is indeed a work of art. Um, one of, a more recent statute regarding penalties of these um, was um, sponsored originally by Ben Nighthorse Campbell, who was a senator from my own state of Colorado. And Senator Campbell was both an artist and a um, Korean veteran. And he, he pushed the legislation based on his anger uh, associated with um, an, a negative impact on the Korean memorial. But he was um, very concerned about the concept of losing the artist's 
um, rendition and image uh, for that time. And these are incredible works of art uh, that are, in many instances, simply mag magnificent. You, uh, you are from the West. There's always a tension when you name uh, an interior secretary about where their biases are going to lie when it comes to the region. Um, tell me a little bit about your own approach to uh, managing uh, uh, public lands, to balancing the needs of, of conservation, of water rights, and, and these other uh, aspects. Uh, what have you tried to achieve uh, as secretary? Well, um, you know, I'm really lucky. I work for um, a president who really, from the very beginning of his um, campaigning as a candidate, and certainly right when he came into office, um, focused on a number of great conservation items. For example, he was very interested in ensuring that we uh, kept our federal lands federal, um, which was not a position um, that was widely held um, in the Republican Party at the time. That was a key issue for him. He also felt very strongly that we needed to enhance public access to our great uh, public lands. And over the last four years, just within the Fish and Wildlife Service, we've expanded hunting and fishing opportunities. Um, by September, we will have expanded fishing and hunting opportunities on over 4.3 million acres of land. And we're on the verge of legislation that will fundamentally uh, restore um, our parks and, um, and public lands with a great infrastructure investment in uh, maintaining our parks, as well as um, providing for the land and water conservation funds. So the president, um, the president has also been committed to the Everglades and a significant uh, amount of funding. I was just in the Everglades the other day and I had folks say to me, look, for years we said the government, federal government had not stepped up. We cannot say that anymore. And so I, I feel like we've done a great deal on the side of conservation, but at the same time, we've been very respectful of the role that states play in uh, the management of our wildlife and in the reality that we at the Department of the Interior need to be a good neighbor and a collaborator with, um, with our state neighbors. And so I think we've done a great deal um, on that. Um, we've obviously, done a great deal as it relates to expanding appropriately um, opportunities for energy and natural resource development, and those fundamentally lead to jobs. I grew up in a wonderful community in Western Colorado, but the community's future was tied to the decisions that were made by our land managers. And, um, and it required that the land managers really have a balanced approach uh, to these issues. And we've tried to, um, act in just that way. I uh, know that there's a great deal of, of Indian uh, work that happens underneath uh, your uh, purview. There's certainly been an outsized hit that's been taken by uh, Native American communities on uh, both on reservations and non uh, during uh, this virus outbreak. Uh, what are you seeing in terms of the trend lines there? Is there any uh, particular optimism at the moment, uh, or is this a situation where we're seeing uh, a a group of, of Americans who have a lot of, of the problems associated with uh, severe ramifications for this virus, uh, experiencing them in, in really challenging ways? So uh, one of the things that I've been very impressed with is um, the, the way in which um, leadership of these Indian communities have really leapt into action. I've, I've visited um, uh, locations where uh, the tribal leadership uh, made decisions uh, to get very uh, aggressive in testing and, and taking uh, positive action. And they're actually ahead um, in some of these communities. They're ahead of their neighbors in managing the situation. The other thing is in fairness, the the federal government through the CARES Act and other things invested a great deal of um, resources in uh, Indian country. And um, I think the resources have really been there. For example, I sat down with the uh, 
uh, president of the Navajo Nation. And as we talked about all of the things that they had done to ramp up, one of the things is we had turned a number of facilities into um, uh, basically uh, emergency hospitals. And um, so far, most of that capacity has not been overrun, which was exactly the point of our effort to slow the spread, was to ensure that we had the medical, um, the medical infrastructure, if you will, to deal with these challenges. But that, um, besides those good things, it is true that Indian country has been hit particularly hard, and we're very cognizant of that. Uh, let's go out on this. I know that you uh, have a lot of different uh, areas of work that uh, that you focus on that that deal with uh, long term issues, land management, uh, water rights, et cetera. Uh, but when it comes to something that hopefully will be more of a short term thing regarding this outbreak of of animosity towards American history in the form of of this iconoclasm and the like, is there something that's going to be done afterwards to try to reassert or, or preserve? Are you planning at all uh, for things that can maybe prevent the type of historical gaps in knowledge that we've seen emerge in our citizenry? I'm not asking you to take up the job of the Department of Education, but basically it seems to me a lot of these folks who are tearing these things down, who don't know what they're, they're even looking at, uh, could, could use a lesson or two and maybe that can't just come in the form of, of a plaque that nobody looks at on the side. Well, you know, that's a wonderful point. Um, I'll say two things about that. Um, number one, the um, positioning of memorials and monuments and statutes on our country's property is never done. Um, there are, every day, there's a new story that could potentially be told. Um, secondly, the way in which these stories are told may vary. Um, I have two teenagers, and um, I have been fascinated as we visited national parks how uninterested they are in the visitor's center. And the reason that is, is because by the time we get to the visitor center, they've been on their smartphone uh, pulling down um, key data points of the, um, the particular location that we've gone gotten to and they just want to get out and get going. And so I do think that we as the Department of Interior need to account for that and be more proactive in recognizing that our consumer of the future is not necessarily the consumer um, that drove up with their family um, in 1960. And, and we need to get better and there are more stories to tell to be honest. Um, uh, the, there are great stories to be told. We have such a great country, and we've done uh, so much, and um, we have a lot to be proud of, and, uh, and we shouldn't shirk from telling um, uh, our, our foils as well as our clients. Is there an example of a particularly innovative approach to teaching that story that you've experienced either here in America or overseas? You know, uh, a place that really got the job done in terms of giving you background on the thing that you were seeing or experiencing? Well, well, what I would really say on that is you can't take away from the actual places. And, and what I mean by that is there's no online experience that represent, that, that recreates the opportunity to uh, crawl into a Kiva at Mesa Verde, which was, I did when I was nine, and it was completely inspirational. And so these places have uh, great uh, meaning. You can't, you can't trade um, the sun on your back or the, the wind in your face um, as you peer over the Grand Canyon for anything. And so the most important thing is we need to make sure that we make these places accessible to all Americans and, um, and promote opportunities for them to um, take advantage of them. David Bernhardt, Secretary of the Interior, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. I really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. I'm Ben Dominic. You've been listening to another edition of the Federalist Radio Hour. We'll be back soon with more. Until then, be lovers of freedom and anxious for the fray.